Thanks, uh, and thanks for inviting me to speak. So, you know, I'll confess my uh, guilty feelings up front, which is, you know, the talk is not uh, going to be focused um, on causality or algorithmic aspects of causality, but I do think that causality is important for fairness. Fairness is important uh, when you're thinking about causality, and I'll try to point out uh, those connections um, along the way. Okay, and also, um, if there are slides that you like in my talk, they're probably from um, at least one of my collaborators. Uh, if there are slides you don't like, they're probably the ones that I made, and there are a few of them. Okay, so uh, the talk today is going to be about predictive algorithms, which, as we know, um, are everywhere and are governing more and more um, aspects of our lives, society. And this has many benefits, you know, machine learning can uh, increase efficiency, accuracy, you know, can scale in, the, in ways uh, that we couldn't have imagined um, a few years ago, but there are also concerns. Um, and I really like this example, especially speaking in California, Prop 25 for eliminating cash bail, um, which you know, many people think that eliminating cash bail is a good goal. Um, but of course you have to replace it with something. Uh, the idea was to replace it with a risk assessment algorithm um, or that was a proposal, it was rejected by the voters. And you know, let's talk about causality. I don't know why it was rejected, but certainly there were objections centered on fairness. Okay, so uh, the ACLU in particular said that these types of risk assessment algorithms or automated tools are racially and socioeconomically biased. And when we talk about predictive algorithms, there are sort of concerns about fairness um, everywhere. There are some prominent examples slide I stole from Michael. Um, so, you know, what do we do? We want the advantages of you know, predictive algorithms, automated decision-making, machine learning, but there are these concerns. Fairness is one concern. We need to think about it. Okay? We have uh, ethical and professional responsibility to think about fairness, and in particular about preventing uh, discrimination. So we have minorities, um, protected groups in the population, and we want to make sure that our algorithms are not discriminating against them. And that's the agenda when I talk about fairness, preventing discrimination. Fairness can mean many different things. Okay, so it's not a new question, of course. You know, there are millennia of uh, discussions about fairness uh, in a variety of fields. Um, I think that kind of the impact of computer science on algorithmic decision-making and prediction uh, has caused sort of an explosive interest within computer science for addressing these types of concerns. Um, you know, I think in the beginning, maybe we could say with a straight face that maybe algorithms will make more equitable decisions, but by now we understand that the algorithms sort of inherit the bias from the data they're trained on, from the people who are um, formulating the objectives. There are biases that come up from the algorithmic tools themselves, as we will discuss. So we really need to do um, some serious thinking here. I think both uh, when we talk about machine learning, also when we talk about causality, ideally what we would want um, is this holy grail is to define fairness, okay? maybe in a similar way to the way we define privacy and differential privacy, or that we define cryptographic objectives like semantically secure encryption in the world of uh, cryptography. So to have some holy grail, some beautiful definition that will tell us what fairness is, and then we can build algorithms that are fair. So this is, I think, a very um, appealing objective. It's ended up being hard to pin down. And I think the reason it's hard to pin down is that fairness means a lot of different things to different people in different contexts, under different social norms. So really formulating one, def it's clear that we have to have, if it's going to be one definition, it has to be sort of very uh, flexible to capture different things. Um, and it's difficult to pin down what discrimination might mean. Okay? It can be very subtle, and I'll give some examples in the talk, so I won't get into that right now. Um, and you know, coming at it from a cryptographic perspective, which is what I do, is you know, we're familiar with these kinds of situations. You know, when we talk about cryptography or the world of security, we have lots of different security concerns. And so I think that there's a very appealing research agenda that we can sort of embark on, which is to identify and formalize the types of concerns. You know, maybe it's not just one concern, maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's a thousand. It's clear that there are some prominent ones 
So we can identify them, we can formalize them, and we can mitigate. We can build um, algorithmic tools to mitigate uh, discrimination concerns. And maybe along the way, we'll end up with kind of one definition that uh, unifies uh, all of the concerns that we have. Maybe we won't. I think it'll be a successful research program either way. OK, so causality, when we talk about fairness, um, I think one hope that there is, and I like this hope, is that we can use causal, model, causal models to reason about fairness. Okay, so if we have a really good causal model telling us what's going on in the data, what are the differences between protected groups in the general population, between, for example, men and women, maybe we can use that in order to um, identify discrimination and to define fairness. And I think there was a very compelling approach of Kusner et al by using counterfactuals. So taking a causal model and looking at, for example, what the effects are um, for men and then taking the counterfactual of how you know, a person would be treated if their gender were, were switched, using that to identify discrimination or define fairness. It's a very compelling approach. Um, but of course, the difficulty with it is that we know that all models are wrong. And so if we're using the wrong model to define fairness, well, we might have a wrong definition of fairness. We might make things worse. We might fail to identify discrimination when it's there. So I think it's a very compelling approach. I'm very positive about it, but there's this core difficulty. Of, you know, what do we do when the model is wrong and how do we use a wrong model to define fairness or to, you know, to make sure that we're identifying discrimination? And I think it's analogous to another compelling approach, the approach of individual fairness of Dwork et al. And there's some technical analogy between these two approaches. Um, this is work of mine um, with Dwork, Elvento, and uh, Sur. Right, so mm -hmm. one model using wrong causal model. Yeah. So if we're using the causal model for our definition of fairness and the model is wrong. What do we do? You know, I, I should say, you know, the model might be wrong, but it also, I mean, that doesn't mean that it's not useful. And it doesn't mean that the definition of fairness based on the model is not useful, but we have to be very careful. A particular situation, maybe. Yes. So, sorry, uh, just to qualify. So you started talking about machine learning and prediction and all these things, right? So that relies on inductive biases, which is a model, and those could be wrong. So the whole thing is, is sunk if the model is wrong. So I don't understand. I, I, I understand the objection, but I don't understand how this objection is specific to causal approaches to fairness as opposed to literally anything else. It's not. Okay. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> yeah. So I think that causal, you know, causal approaches have some benefits. You know, so you know, they allow us to do things we can't do in other fields. So there's some hope for using them to reason about fairness, but we still have to face this sort of core difficulty that always exists. There's no, it's not a magic solution to our problem. But, but there was a specific, I'm going to put words in your mouth, Scott. There is an objection that using a, model, a causal model to identify and define the nature of fairness or the conditions by which you evaluate whether a model is fair or not. Here's a problematic there that doesn't exist if you write down a concrete definition and require your predictive model to achieve that definition. Thanks, Michael. Um, okay, so that's in one direction, uh, using causal models to help us uh, define fairness or help us identify discrimination at the very least. Definitions are you know, definitions um, can be a little more tricky if we actually can pinpoint discrimination, we can all agree that things are discriminatory and that can be easier. So that's in one direction. I think in the other direction, the type of results and uh, definitions and algorithmic tools that I'll be talking about today, may be helpful for addressing concerns about discriminatory models. So for example, we might have a model that, a causal model that identifies effects, very causal effects very well in the general population, but misses what's going on in a minority. And how do we think about that? And I think the kinds of tools that I'll talk about today, today may give um, ideas or um, approaches to handling those kinds of concerns. Okay, so that's kind of in a one slide, uh, two takeaways for the relationship with causality, two causal models. Okay, but the focus today is going to be on machine learning and prediction, risk, um, risk prediction, risk scores. Um, so let me start by setting up the, the problem. So 
we have individual instances and we want to assign probabilities, you know, if we're talking about weather, what is the probability that tomorrow it will rain? What's the probability that a given individuals with features, observed features X, will repay a loan if we give it to them? Um, what is the probability given an image of a tumor or certain features that it will metastasize and cause cancer? What's the probability that um, a defendant um, who's up for bail will commit a violent crime if we release them, will recidivate, okay? So these are the kinds of uh, questions we want to answer when we're talking about risk prediction. And the problem, and it's a fundamental problem uh, in statistics and computer science and machine learning is, you know, what is the probability? These are non-repeatable events, right? We only get to observe once whether this particular individual repays the loan, whether the tumor metastasizes, whether an individual um, commits a crime or not. So how can we talk about probability when we only get to observe the outcome once? Um, we're not going to solve this uh, basic problem that's been debated. Um, and you know, are there probabilities? Is everything deterministic? These are deep questions, but we can formalize things easily. And I wanna stick to the following uh, specific model. We have a distribution, okay? We have over individuals throughout the talk, think of it as a um, uh, distribution over people. We get to see observable features X and outcomes Y, Boolean outcomes, binary zero or one throughout the talk. Okay, so did this individual with these features repay the loan? And once we, can, we think about, once we define this underlying distribution, we can talk about an individual's true probability of having outcome one, okay, of repaying the loan. And that's what we want to predict. So given an individual X, I want to learn, I want to predict what's the probability that the outcome will be one. Again, we have this uh, warning about uh, probabilities of non-repeatable events, but this is the model. And now things I think formally are clear. So our goal is to use a training set of labeled examples, and then to be able to predict the true probabilities or some good approximation to them. And we'll talk in a minute about what a good approximation can be. Okay. So we want to design a learning algorithm that gets a training set of labeled examples and outputs a predictor. We're not going to be able to get our hands in general. You know, we, we're trying to deal with complicated questions like what's the probability that an individual will recidivate. We're not going to be able to get our hands on perfect probabilities. It's hopeless in, for these kinds of problems at least you know, given the features that we have at hand. So we want some good approximation. We want a predictor P tilde. That's a good estimate for every individual, for most individuals, gives a good estimate, estimate of the true probability of the outcome being one. Okay, so that's the goal um, for risk prediction. And when we talk about fairness, there are biases. Um, you know, we have this sort of a uh, sausage grinder that's taking the uh, data set, the training data and producing for us a predictor, what's going on in the data, what's going on in the algorithm and the objectives that are set up, what's going on in the predictor that it's outputting. There are fairness concerns in every stage of this pipeline. Okay, um, and of course, if the data is biased, then there's no reason to think that the predictor won't inherit the biases in the data. Okay, so for example, if we're looking at uh, financial data and there's been um, all sorts of discrimination against minorities and you know, due to that they've received less loans or they've received less favorable terms and they've ended up repaying in smaller rates, our algorithm will learn this discrimination and will perpetuate it. There could also be further biases induced by the algorithm. Okay, so for example, machine learning algorithms often you know, use a regularization term. They try, to simpli they try to produce a simple predictor. So if we have some protected set that on average are more likely to default, the machine learning optimization might end up giving on S completely or to a large extent, including giving up on actual qualified members of the minority. So these are, there are many concerns about discrimination. I think these are two good ones to have in mind um, throughout the talk today. Okay, so how do we define fairness? How do we uh, think about it? There are lots of different works. I'll just, I'll highlight a few of them that are relevant for what I wanna say today. One approach that's what's, I think most predominantly used today in practice is these notions that we call group fairness. So we think about a protected group, maybe a racial minority, um, 
maybe based on gender, socioeconomic status. So we take a protected group and we want our predictor to behave similarly, whatever that means, on the protected group and on the general population. Okay. So that's our goal, or that's a group notion of fairness. And behaving similarly can mean very different things, right? We can talk about statistical parity. So requiring that the predictor outputs similar predictions on the protected group and the general population. It just that might it might make sense or it might not make sense, depending on the context. In some contexts, it does make sense. In others, it doesn't. For example, really, you know, for some reason, we really think the protected group is more likely um, to, to default for reasons that we are okay with in terms of fairness, then we won't try to enforce statistical parity, but then we can still enforce measures requiring that the predictor be as accurate on the protected group as on the general population. We could ask for similar false positive or negative rates or we could require things like calibration, which I'll define shortly, so I won't get into it today, but basically saying that the predictions need to be meaningful, both on the protected group and on the general, or similarly meaningful um, on the protected group in the general population. So there are various things we could require. Still, I think at a high level, when you talk about group notions of fairness, there are several um, problematic aspects. First, the fairness guarantees are actually quite weak because they're only an aggregate over the group. Okay, so in aggregate over the group, accuracy is similar between the protected uh, population and the general population. What does it mean for qualified loan applicants, for example? Um, also, these can be at odds with each other. So for example, so famously um, requiring similar false positive and negative rates and calibration simultaneously um, basically is impossible unless you can get perfect predictions. And I think a core difficulty is really, you know, what is the protected group? Is the protected group the entire minority? Is the protected group the qualified loan applicants? Um, so when we just identify one or a few uh, disjoint protected groups, we're really missing out on kind of the interesting guarantees that we want to enforce at a fine-grained uh, level. Um, there's a famous example um, that I think drives this uh, point home of Dwork et al. in their work on individual fairness. And uh, they talk about a steakhouse that's trying to advertise. And you know the steakhouse is um, racist. So it really doesn't want members of S to show up. Nonetheless, you know, maybe there's a regulation in place or for optics, they need to, they're required to enforce statistical parity. So they need to advertise at similar rates to the minority and to the general population. So what should the steakhouse owner do? Well, they just go ahead and they advertise to the vegetarians in the protected group and the meat eaters or some fraction of the meat eaters in the general population. So overall, they achieve statistical parity. The rate of advertising to the general population and to members of S is similar, but it's clear that this is a complete abuse, right? They're not advertising to anyone who's actually going to show up in the protected group. So that's a failure of group notions of fairness and now replace uh, vegetarians with uh, or carnivores with qualified loan applicants and you see the problem. Right. So really fairness depends on identifying who the relevant subgroups are for the task at hand and that can be very difficult. So our perspective departing from group fairness and this work that I want to tell you about also a parallel work of Kearns et al is we don't know who the relevant subgroups are. So let's just protect every group that we can identify given the data at hand and given some reasonable computational limitations. <coughs> so this works better for some notions of fairness than for, not, for others. And particularly, I wanna tell you about multi-calibration, which is guaranteeing calibration for every group within a rich family, within a rich collection, very rich collection of sets. Okay, so we're going to guarantee calibration, which I'll define in a minute. It's an accuracy requirement for the members of S in aggregate and for the vegetarians and for the carnivores and for the carnivores that wear glasses and for the carnivores that don't like to wear glasses. Um, think about this family and this sort of a complexity theoretic perspective, think of it as a computational bound. Okay, so every group that can be identified by a Boolean circuit of a certain size, by a conjunction, a decision list, et cetera. Okay. I want to define calibration, but uh, pausing for a question for a moment. 
everything is clear. Okay, so before defining calibration, here's a weaker requirement. This is what we call multi-accuracy for the predictor. And now the requirement will be that for every subset, for every subset in our collection, this can be an exponential size collection, the expectation of the predictions is similar to the expected outcomes for that group. Okay, so for example, if we're talking about a group of qualified loan applicants, the expected outcome is that they will return the loan with very, very high probability. And so the predictions need to be very, very high. The predictions need to assign them very high probabilities of returning the loan. Okay, so that's a weaker requirement. Calibration requires something even stronger. Okay, so for example, of the people in the group for whom the predictor predicts a 0 0.9 probability of say returning the loan, really about 90% of them should get outcome one. Okay, and not only for the people for whom the predictor predicts 0 0.9, but actually for every prediction category. You know, if we think about deciles, for the ones for whom they, the predictor predicts 0 0.2, 20% should get outcome one, roughly 0 0.3, 30% should get outcome one, et cetera. Okay, so this is, a this is the requirement of calibration. It'll come up in the next two talks as well. So you can ask me a question if it's not clear now. Um, and we require this not just for one group, one protected group, but for every group in an exponential, potentially exponential collection. So you chose this definition of all the families that can be recognized in some sense, right? I mean, it could be like, I don't know, families that can be verified as membership or drafted or whatever. But why this? I mean, it makes sense, but I, I, is there extra anything you could say about that? So I'll talk, I'll get to it later. Um, so I like the question of, you know, as always, you're thinking uh, out of the box. Um, we were really, I think, you know, Perhaps uh, some of us understood it better than others. I didn't understand it as clearly at this point, uh, possibly Omer and Michael and Ursula did. Um, that really these families are talking about, these are tests. And I'll get to it when we talk about indistinguishability. But these are sort of tests that are see, checking if something is wrong with the predictions. And we're talking about um, tests that can be computed by a computing device of some sort. And then I think the minute I think about a computing device, the most basic one for me is like a Turing machine or a circuit. So tests, you know, similarly now we think in photography so about so uh, distinguishing. So I can alternatively think about it as characterizing families that should be protected or <laughs> that I will not that I will get away with it with respect to these tests. Yes. So nobody's and then, going to catch me if those are the tests right. that they are applying. Right, okay. right. And I think, you know, as you're suggesting, maybe we could think about much more powerful notions of tests, like interactive ones or games where there are challenges and responses. And there are some extensions along these lines in the later work, and you know, maybe there's much more that can be done. So if the groups are individual people, like if the groups are individuals, then you're asking for perfect accuracy. So is, is the trick that you can't identify individual people just no so you're right that uh, the subsets i just talked about the computational limitation of identifying the subset but in fact i'm also going to require that they have some density in the distribution and i'm brushing this under the rug in the new copy okay so that's going to be our um, requirement i think it's a strong requirement especially you know, if you think about every set that can be identified by a polynomial size circuit that's a very strong requirement, and you might object and say it's too strong, maybe you're right, but I want to convince you that, in fact, it's also a reasonable requirement or we can get a lot out of it. So the flavor of results is that there actually um, exists for every family, even an exponential family, there exists a uh, multi-calibrated uh, predictor, and it's not much more, the complexity of actually computing the predictions is not much more than just checking membership in the families in the collection C. So these multi-calibrated predictors exist. There's an algorithm for finding them. Okay, there are questions about the complexity. The complexity is related to the complexity of agnostic learning. Um, and I think one really useful fact that I'll also touch on is, uh, in fact, we can impose this requirement. Since this require requirement is in line with accuracy, and no one has objected to that, so I'm just going to keep going and get to it in the end. 
In fact, impose this, this requirement can be uh, obtained via post-processing on a given predictor, and it won't degrade the accuracy. Um, good, so I won't actually go into the algorithm because I want to say other things, but uh, just to tell you, we do have an algorithm, and what it does is it gets as input the collection of sets C, the tests, as Shafi was saying, and a sample of label data from the distribution. Oh, it grinds and grinds and grinds. It produces a predictor that is calibrated on every one of these sets simultaneously. For every one of these sets, simultaneously, the predictions are calibrated. So the um, predictor is not much more complex than membership checking for groups in C. Um, the running time of the algorithm can depend on the size of the collection of sets or does, can depend unless you can get a shortcut uh, via some sort of agnostic learning algorithm. Um, so that's the catch. It's a very simple algorithm. Um, so let me go ahead because there are other things I wanna tell you about, but I just wanna show that you know, we can really see the algorithms. The algorithm is sort of three lines of code. It looks, it starts with a naive predictor, say it assigns 0 0.5 to everyone. And then it just sort of iteratively searches for a group where the predictions aren't calibrated and fixes the predictions on that group, okay? Until there are no such groups remaining and then it stops and outputs the predictor. Um, the main question about the algorithm is whether it will converge, right? Like maybe I fix one group and then another group runs away and becomes uncalibrated and I, I get stuck in some loop, but there's a potential analysis showing uh, that you won't get stuck. In fact, you can't produce uh, predictions that are simultaneously calibrated for all the groups. And you can apply this as post-processing. So given whatever predictor, um, you know, maybe we have some sophisticated neural net that someone has trained, some gigantic model. It's known that these models don't necessarily produce calibrated predictions. So we can just apply this as post-processing, go ahead and iteratively search for a group where the predictions aren't calibrated, fix it, do this for a few times. The number of um, iterations is bounded and uh, this won't hurt the accuracy or at least not by much of the predictor that we started out with. Like, I guess if I'm thinking of like the neural network example, uh, if I have like a bunch of things and then I post process them, given new things. Like you assume I'm able to change the prediction directly, right? Like I'm not. Yeah, so I'm not changing, I'm not, it's sort of black box. I'm not changing the weights of the net. I'm sort of imposing these little nudges on the different groups as you know, a post-processing on the predictions that are produced. So, you know, you might say nice theoretical results, um, but maybe this is sort of the um, undoable in practice. So we do have a project with uh, Noah and Noam, who are here in the audience. This is Barda et al. Um, from Khalid Research, where this was applied to cardiac and osteoporotic risk. Uh, predictors. Um, so these are used, no, I know I'm going tell you much more about this uh, than I can, but these are predictors that are, you know, best practice uh, used in medicine to predict the probability of serious health uh, events occurring in the future and used for preventative care. Okay. So these predictors are known to be, um, there's been literature showing that they can be miscalibrated for minority populations. In this uh, project, what we did is we identified a collection of sets by looking at these five different attributes um, and all possible combinations of them. So for example, looking at the subset, a certain intersection of these fields, this uh, created 360 different subgroups. And we looked at what was happening with uh, best practice uh, cardiac and osteoporotic risk predictors that were being used in terms of their calibration guarantees and what would happen um, if the algorithm, uh, by applying the algorithm or a variant of the algorithm that I told you about. So this is for cardiac risk. This is a plot of calibration. So um, here on the x-axis, we have the different groups, uh, the, different cali the calibration of the different groups and the number of groups at each calibration level. So one is very good calibration, that's sort of here. And then the further you go away to the left or the right, those are groups where either the predictions are under what they should be or over, the risk is overestimated or underestimated. This is the picture for the actual predictors that are used with respect <clears throat> to the groups that we identified. 
and applying um, our algorithm as um, <clears throat> you can see there's significant miscalibration for many groups and applying our algorithm as post-processing, we get much nicer calibration guarantees. Okay, so almost all the groups are very nicely, the predictions are very nicely calibrated. Um, Noah will mention a little bit of deployment of this. So this was not deployed, but there was a different deployment for COVID risk prediction. I think Noah will mention it briefly in her talk. Uh, the takeaway is that calibration was significantly improved without hurting discrimination. It's also a fairly lightweight post-processing. If you wanna talk about interpretability, maybe there's an advantage to what we're doing here in terms of really identifying these demographic subgroups and understanding what we're doing on them, sort of informal. Question? <clears throat> sure. Um, I was wondering, since it's in line with um, prediction, is there a way to just um, uh, like construct a better objective function that you could use to create the same thing as your post processing does? <clears throat> so it's a good question. Of course, you could simply have the objective with lo which looks at the maximum miscalibration on any group and use that as a loss function. One issue is the calibration in general is not uh, convex. So there are computational issues. Um, there are computational issues with that. I know Homer and Michael want to add anything on that. Correction comes to say. Uh, yeah, I think what you said is quite accurate. I don't think you can write a single convex loss function and say no value is integer calculation. Just without the convex There's a microphone in China. Um, there's a microphone. Yeah, so very true is saying that, that there isn't necessarily one loss function, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, one convex brag, yeah, loss one, function. one convex loss function. I'll, I'll brag about Bridget's recent work that shows that even though multi calibration doesn't make reference to any loss function, there are consequences of obtaining multi calibration that imply loss minimization for a broad class of. Yeah. So I'll mention a little bit uh, also the connection connections between calibration and loss minimization in the time that I don't have left. <laughs> that I won't have left when we get to it. Um, good. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you about multi-calibration. Um, since that work, I think there's been an explosion of different works that sort of uh, build on it, change it, uh, challenge it. Um, I want to tell you about a few of my, uh, a few ones <coughs> since I have the stage that I want to talk about. So the first, and this is going to your question a little bit. So instead of talking about, you know, getting good calibration for all the groups, we could talk about other losses, right? We could talk about L2 loss, L1 loss. We could talk about whatever loss you can imagine and beyond. And then we could define multi-group requirements, right? We want, for example, if we were thinking about agnostic uh, learning type of guarantees, we would want that for every group simultaneously, the loss obtained is competitive with some benchmark class. Maybe each group has a different benchmark class. Um, and we can obtain these. And in fact, the way we can, we can obtain them for very general loss functions and the way we obtain them or the way I know how to obtain them goes through multi-calibration. I'll talk about that in a minute. This is going back to Shafi's question. So this has been strengthened in a different direction showing um, that calibration is somehow giving us predictions that are indistinguishable in a formal sense from the true probabilities P star. Okay, so the, the, the predictions really um, cannot be refuted by some class of tests that's related to the collection of groups and just given samples um, from the data. Um, Omer, in his talk, will talk about a uh, different direction, very excited, about, I think it's very exciting, uh, showing robustness properties of these calibrated predictors. I don't know, robustness can mean different things, but basically showing that these predictors can be used in lots of different settings uh, after, lots of different settings after they have been trained and they're robust to the change in settings in various ways. And I think my uh, question or my uh, hope um, for the audience here is you know, can we also um, get these kinds of guarantees? Are they interesting when we're looking at causal models, guaranteeing uh, that the models behave well also on subgroups or with, re with respect to large uh, rich families of tests that we can apply to the models? <clears throat> 
So just to give you uh, one idea, and I'll end there, of the kinds of um, the strength of the multi-calibration guarantee, and this is a result with uh, Galiona, basically saying that essentially for any loss function uh, for which you want to obtain a multi-group loss minimization guarantee, so any loss function, the audience here can think about a lot, but essentially any loss function you can think of for which the guarantee makes sense, for any collection of groups and for any benchmark class that you want to define, you can obtain predictions that are simultaneously optimal or nearly optimal for all the groups with respect to this benchmark class. And the way you do it is by training a multi-calibrated predictor. Okay, so given this loss function and the collection of groups and the benchmark class, there exists a collection of sets, C prime, it's not the same until Parikshit speaks, it's not going to be the same as the original collection of groups, but it's a related uh, collection, not much more complicated, such that if you train a predictor that is calibrated for this collection of groups, it will also be competitive with H for all of the groups in your original set with respect to the loss function L simultaneously. And I'm cheating a little bit, it's not the same predictor that will be uh, competitive, but you can tweak the multi-calibrated predictor to get um, one that is competitive um, for all the groups in C. Okay, so just to sum up, uh, we have this concern about discrimination and fairness. It's difficult to get a hand on. Discrimination can be subtle. Think about the steakhouse and the vegetarians. It's very dependent on the context. Okay, so advertising um, a shampoo um, differently to men versus women is very different from advertising a job differently to men versus women. So very context dependent. Um, and we have this approach of multi-group fairness, calibration and beyond that can deal with some of the concerns that we have in a formal and systematic way. I do want to highlight that this was dealing with concerns that are, or this was guaranteeing fairness that's in line with accuracy with respect to the data that we have. Okay, so if the data is flawed, being calibrated with respect to the data is not going to save us. And I think that's a very, very interesting direction uh, or possibly the most important direction uh, to keep hammering in on. And we have rich theory, uh, implementations, deployment, um, and I think the area is uh, really sort of up and running. I talked about uh, causal models and where I hope uh, some of this reasoning um, can find uh, further applications or uses. Um, Gal in her talk will, and I guess Omer as well, uh, in a different way, both of the talks will talk about how we actually go, once we have these predictions, what can we use them for and how? Um, I told you about this big concern that if the data are biased, we're really going to be in trouble. Just learning something that is you know, fairly reflecting the data won't save us if the data themselves are biased. Um, and I won't talk about complex resource allocation problems because I'm out of time, so I'll end here. Thank you. Are we doing a chart? <laughs> I love it, just Yeah, so it's more of a remark than a question. Um, I understand all of this in the context of predictions, but I don't see the connection to fairness, at least the way I understand this concept. It should be that your <clears throat> rules are oblivious to uh, specific desirable outcomes. Um, now, when you are trying to improve predictions, of course, you uh, very much want particular desirable outcomes. I'm not sure I understand your question, but I think I, 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 I just don't understand this as a notion of fairness. So, you know, again, going back. Uh, it's not the notion of fairness, it's uh -huh. a notion of fairness. Yeah, so, uh, so, I, I don't so for example, a predictor that, uh, so go back to the loan example, a predictor that's ignoring qualified candidates in the minority, but is finding the qualified candidates in the general population, I think is being discriminatory. I, I think, okay, so my 
I think classically fairness that your rules are oblivious to um, you know any desirable outcomes that, that you may have. I think that's one setting in which fairness is important is when you're sort of setting rules for individuals to compete. Now the rules being oblivious to the outcome, I don't know what that. I'm not sure what that okay. means, but for example, example what, I, what I'm trying to rule say is, is, that, is that I think somehow fairness can't be measured by what comes out of it. Uh, I mean, if you, if you want to improve your predictions on, uh, you know, whether or not people will return their loans, then uh, this is a reasonable approach to, to doing that. But I don't see why that implies fairness. So it might, it implies a certain type of fairness, which is this okay, type. Yeah. Um, it, no one is claiming that it you know, will solve all the fairness problems in the world. In particular, you know, you might be very accurate on the minority and still because the data are biased, they will get predictions that are not reflective of their true qualifications for receiving the loan. And there's still a problem. I, th I do think that even if that's the case, if that's what we're concerned about, which I'm not sure it is, but I'll keep going anyway. Um, I, I'm not concerned about anything. I, I just uh, find this definition of fairness to be or, or defining, <laughs> the, defining a particular goal that you state as fairness. I find that weird. So I think it's a certain it type. It's a certain type of fairness addressing a certain type of concern. Mm -hmm. I also think that if we want to think about more classical concerns or other concerns, like for example, maybe the data. So you you keep trying. You keep talking about the results of how the thing. You, you have some system where I think things are being allocated, and you want to make sure that the allocations are somehow fair. That's a sense I'm getting. So no. So saying? so so my point is exactly the opposite. That. Judging the fairness of an allocation by the outcome of the allocation is not is not fairness. It's efficiency. It's uh, uh, you know accuracy. It's whatever, but it's not fairness because fairness should be something that ignores uh, the outcome of it's 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 a uh, it's an innate property of the rules rather than uh, what they produce. Good. So I think that um, you know, on some philosophical level, I think that's an admirable approach. But I think in practice, we have no way of knowing because we don't know what the data are, because we don't know, you know we set up some rules. And for example, if you look at the law, the law says very clearly in the United States in some contexts, you are not allowed to look at, an, you know, at a person's race. And so long as you are blind to the race attribute, you are fair. So it's about the process. It's not about the outcome. A lot of the lines of the I understand. But that. how do I judge such a process without knowing you know, what the data are, basically without knowing what the causal model behind the data is? And I can never know what the causal model behind the data uh -huh. is because I don't know what the right model is. And so what we are focusing on is actually things that we can measure mm -hmm. in this work. There are other works that talk about you know, imposing some model or imposing a metric and using that to define fairness. That's fine. I don't challenge that. I'm just saying this doesn't have much to do with fairness. Uh, it, 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 it has to do with, with, with other things you may wish to uh, achieve, but I don't think you can. I think it has to do with uh, something I wish to achieve, which is yeah. fairness, but we can uh, take the disagreement. Okay. But maybe you missed a slide or something? <laughs> the slide where he talks about. You know, uh, parody, the plus and the minus. I understand. What, what? I think over coffee because there are other questions. Yeah. Other yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, my question is, as in the context of that, for example, so if I understand correctly, you calibrate against one test set, right? Your predictions are calibrated on one set of data. Yeah. And you have every, any guarantees to a new set of data. Fantastic. So fantastic. So that's a question about generalization guarantees and generalization error. And in fact, yeah, so everything I showed was with respect to um, a holdout set of data. The, the results are all measured uh, with respect to held out data from the same distribution. But you're asking a really good question, which is what do we do about, for example, if I train a predictor that is calibrated 
um, on training data drawn IIB from a distribution is it guaranteed to also be calibrated with respect to the underlying distribution? Um, there's fantastic work. So we address this for our particular algorithm. We think carefully about the calibration guarantee. And for example, there's no problem with testing. You know, if you hold out some data in your training algorithm and you make sure you're calibrated with respect, once you have your predictor, you make sure you're calibrated with respect to the held out data, you'll be fine. In general, thinking about generalization with respect to calibration guarantees is a good question. It is not, amazingly, it's not well understood. There's some very nice work of uh, Cohen, Mansour, and do you remember? Shaban. Hmm? Shaban. Shaban. Uh, recent work that's addressing this problem and showing general sort of uh, uniform convergence bounds of the type we like um, based on things like, I don't remember whether is it VC dimension in their work or a different dimension based on various different dimensions, but I think there's a lot, of, it's not well understood and there's a lot of work to do. Thanks. Yeah, my, my question is about um, in what sense, or if you could say a bit more about like why you think that calibration related concepts would advance uh, social justice or equity in outcomes in a setting where, I mean, you're kind of reifying the true predicted, the true, the true probability of some, you know, repaying the loan or whatever it might be. But that true probability in our actual world is very bad. It's not a thing that we want to respect if, if that true probability is influenced by this history of oppression, marginalization, and mechanisms that were historically and presently unfair. And so I don't want to preserve the true probability of repaying the loan because it's sort of tainted by this uh, by this badness. So, so yeah, it's a fantastic question. I mean, it's a depressing question, but it's a fantastic question. And I think this is really the big challenge uh, that I was trying to point out is what do we do when the data are not what we want to perpetuate and sort of accurately reflect? That's exactly the question. And I want to say that even then, if what we are doing with the data is first training a predictor, it's very reasonable to take the data, the, you know, the, the data that has all of these horrible biases inherited from the real world, train a predictor, and try to understand what's going on and fix it. Okay, so that's a very natural approach. Um, you know. You could do other things. I think this is a natural approach. And if that's the approach you're taking, your predictor had better accurately reflect what's going on for different groups so you can fix it. So you had better start with a predictor that is multi-calibrated or is certainly not ignoring what's going on with the groups in the flawed you know, data that we want to fix. Okay, so I think this is a natural, even when we're doing that, and I agree with you that that's the important question, but that's an important question. There are contexts where I think this is, you know, we're multi-calibrated, for example, a medical context, depending on what, what country you live in, the medical data can be more or less biased. And then, you know, maybe it does make sense to talk about multi-calibration, but in many settings, I agree that it doesn't, and we want to fix what's going on in the data. And I still think this is, this can be a good starting point. Okay. Yeah, I think that, Unless you're just going to the data and doing freeform exploration, which you know maybe makes sense. If the first thing you're doing is sort of trying to train something that is telling you in this data what are the probabilities, trying to get your hands on the probability in the data, what you are starting with and better accurately reflect what's going on in different subgroups. Otherwise, you know, we can't make progress. Is the post-processing assuming sort of like a back setting where you have a bunch of I, I guess I'm thinking like if I'm a doctor or something, I see like one patient and I want to give them the risk score that I think is calibrated for them already. Do I need to wait until I collect like a whole group of patients and then run this calibration and then return? Yeah, so the results I talked about were in a batch setting, but there are lots of works, um, both works, older works and newer works that talk about online settings where you know, the patients come in. The individuals come in one by one, and you want your predictions to have been calibrated in hindsight or multi calibrated in hindsight, and there are algorithms for doing this, so it can be a tool. I don't, if someone has a reference from one of the recent works of Kieran's and Roth, there are several works. Um, I can ask me later, and I'll take them. So. If there's like an individual that's part of many more groups than other individuals, does that mean that? Uh, like asking for more calibration would like wait the the impact of that individual's data on your predictor. 
It's an interesting question. I don't, uh, I don't know the answer offhand. Uh, we'd have to think about, we'd have to define some notion of what impact an individual has on, on the, we could think about it by defining some notion and maybe like a Shapley value or something like that, uh, the effect that an individual has on the predictions and think about it. It's an interesting question. I haven't thought about it. Let's take other questions off. 